So socialist realism became an official doctrine and acted upon as a general cultural principle in the USSR in the early 30s and persisted in various articulations until the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991. And arguably, it has its many afterlives today in the national republics and, of course, many very weird reincarnations in contemporary Russia. Um, neither a style nor a form, socialist realism prescribed a set of ideological and content-driven imperatives to the sphere of cultural production. From one perspective, socialist realism could be considered the cultural wing of dialectical materialism, an all-encompassing philosophical worldview and a system that ascribes natural laws to social and historical development, and one that was declared as the official philosophical system in the USSR, with Stalin. And yet, from another perspective, socialist realism can be considered what I call the Achilles' heel of the dialectical materialism, in a sense that socialist realist aesthetic theory conceived of art as an ideal that could not be reduced to its social, naturalistic, ontological, or economic determinants. Socialist realism, I argue, was haunted by this ideal as a double edged sword. One which, on the one hand, both transposed the Stalinist dialectical materialism to the sphere of aesthetics and thus contributed to the totalistic understanding of all phenomena through a teleology of nature, and on the other hand, superseded this total assumption. It did so because it pointed towards a multi-layered historical temporality and a dormant futurity, one that lied underneath the calcified layers of the Stalinist schematization of the historical time of the October Revolution. Don't worry, I'll pack <laughs> all this tense jargon. Furthermore, I think that the relationship between objective reality and representation that the Marxian aesthetic theory proposed can still be of importance for us as we return to the question of reality and its representation or figuration today. So I'll start today by outlining the basic tenets of dialectical materialism that from now on I'll call diamat, borrowing from the Stalinist jargon, and its rearticulation in Stalinism before I turn to the discussion of aesthetic theory and the concept of the ideal in socialist realism in the writings of George Lukacs and uh, Mikhail Lifshitz in the Soviet 30s. So I start with a quote. Dialectical materialism is the philosophy of Marxist, Marxism-Leninism a scientific worldview, a general method of comprehending the world, a science of more general laws of movement and development of nature, society, and consciousness. Dialectical materialism is the highest form of contemporary materialism and is the summation of all the history of development of philosophical thought." End of the quote. Thus starts the great Soviet encyclopedia, uh, and its lengthy entry on dialectical materialism. And what we learn from this abbreviated uh, quote that I translated is the following. Number one, dialectical materialism is a philosophy of Marxism-Leninism. Thus, it is partisan, but this partisanship reflects universalism because Marxism-Leninism um, is the truthful scientific method and worldview that is not only diagnostic of historical and social and natural development, but also prognostic. Number two, the Amat is a scientific worldview. Thus, it is grounded in scientific truth. Three, it is a method of understanding the world, the true method. And four, it is a science that discerns the general laws governing not just history, but also nature, as well as consciousness. What we also learn is that it is the summit of philosophical thinking and incorporates the most advanced scientific developments of its day. The Ahmad isn't yet another school of thought, but the philosophical system, science, method, all in one that incarnated in the historical experience of the Stalinist Soviet Union. So what we are dealing with is the peculiarity of a philosophy, of a system, um, a philosophical system and method that rules in its most direct and literal sense. The Amat takes its root from Engels' Dialectic of Nature of 1883, which relies on the proposition that dialectics is to, to be found in nature. 
In Engels' formulation, the very basis of the Ahmad is the scientific study of nature and its dialectical movement according to its laws. And these laws of the dialectic are those that also apply to and condition the historical world. Within the advancement of science, Engels says, and I quote him, it was as if the world were to be shown that henceforth the reciprocal law of motion would be as valid for the highest product of organic matter, the human mind, as for inorganic substance, end of quote. And it is this dialectical unity um, of the organic and inorganic, of mind and matter, of nature and history, as a law of movement and contradiction that the Amat establishes. The movement of matter is characterized by differentiation of species and of consciousness. The dialectic of nature uh, operates according to three basic laws derived from physics. The first one being the law of the transformation of, the qu of quantity into quality and vice versa. Number two, the law of the negation of negation. Uh, sorry, number two, the law of interpretation, interpenetration of opposites. It's hard to say these things, right? <laughs> and number three, the law of the negation of negation. For Engels, transformation from quad quantity to quality is the essence of motion and is that which through differentiation brings about history. This movement is not one that is of concepts applied to a static material world, but it is the material world itself that through its movement generates the mobility of concepts. This is a materialist uh, worldview, of course. For Engels, history as itself a historical formation in its capitalist stage is still too close to the animal kingdom because the social organization of production amongst men is not consciously planned as to serve all mankind equally. Engels' dialectic of nature grounds historical development in general laws governing nature and this development is, is ultimately is that which brings about rational and conscious organiza organization of social production with communism. One could say that in some sense historical materialism and its Engelsian articulation is both impossible to disentangle from the dialectic of nature, yet it is also subordinate to it. So it is not accidental, right, that the Western Marxism or historical materialism, Western historical materialism, um, does not derive its theoretical premises and method from Engels or Engels' ontology of nature, but from Marx's ontology of history. For Western Marxism as opposed to Eastern Marxism, nature can't be humanized and it is ultimately indifferent to us. Yet within Soviet history itself, even in its most constricted interpretations of the Amat during the years of high Stalinism and Zhdanovism in the 40s, there was ample debate regarding the parameters of this philosophical system, method, and worldview, even allowing one to detect an idealist and materialist split within Soviet materialism, with the weight of the official validation being on the side of the latter, of the so-called materialist camp. If the so-called idealist conception of the Ahmad grounded the Ahmad in Lenin's understanding of Hegel and in the coincidence of what Lenin called dialectics, logic, and theory of cognition, the so-called materialist camp based the Ahmad on modern science and the positivistic conception of thought as a direct product of matter. If the so-called idealist camp, um, and we are talking about objective idealism here, turned on its head by Marx and followed by Lenin, viewed philosophy as a science that encompasses general laws of nature and society, objective dialectic, and laws of thought, subjective dialectic, with the first, the objective one, determining the second, the subjective dialectic. The second, that is the materialist uh, conception within the materialist camp, poses the ontological primacy of matter over mind. We should keep in mind, again, that social being in a Marxian understanding is not reduced to matter. It encompasses an organic complex of things and relations which always take place, what Marx, borrowing from Hegel, said, behind the back of consciousness. During the height of Stalinism, one could risk being thrown to the trash bin of idealist deviationists if a dose of Hegelianism was high enough in one's thoughts or writings. Though actually it's quite ironic uh, that in, uh, at the very height 
of Stalinism in 1937, the Soviet Academy of Sciences publishes the fifth volume of Hegel's uh, complete works, The Science of Logic, with a foreword that provides the following rationale for the publication. Science of Logic sets the laws of dialectic, was influential for Lenin, and it is the least idealistic work of Hegel. The preface to the publication <laughs> displays the typical antagonistic rhetoric of the Stalinist years, mobilized as a weapon against the ideological vermin on the philosophical front. The mechanistic and idealistic Mensheviks, the theoretical armor of the Trotskyite counter-revolutionaries, and the right restorers of capitalism. So Hegel becomes a weapon uh, against these deviationists. It is important to keep these dialectically, diametrically opposite, op opposite interpretations of dialectical materialism for our discussion on the relationship between Diamat and socialist realism in the minutes that will follow. One question for now is, what does it mean to conceive of history as one that, uh, sorry, conceive of philosophy as that which literally rules and one that is self-transparently the language of power? Of course, today positivism is the language of power, but not self-transparently. What does it mean to conceive of a dialectic that rules and the rule of a dialectic? Let's re recall that for Engels, the highest realization of the dialectic of nature is with the social reorganization and appropriation of the products of man man's labor with communism. That is, when there is no more temporal lag between the means and forces of production and the relations of production. And this is precisely what was argued in the notorious short course of 1938, the history of the Bolshevik party of the Soviet Union, uh, allegedly written by Stalin himself. After physically annihilating the old Bolsheviks who have lived through and witnessed the revolution, the short course rewrites the history of the October Revolution from a Stalinist perspective. Here, Stalin was often a marginal figure throughout the months preceding and succeeding the revolution. He was a sort of administrator, organizer, organizer on the ground, rather than the theoretician. Um, he appears as Lenin Stalin, uh, Lenin's right-hand man, his most trusted comrade. Of course, photomontage was amply uh, mobilized for these purposes as well. The short course declares the victory of socialism in the confines of the Soviet state and serves as a political theoretical validation of the 1926 official decision of the 14th party plenum of constructing socialism in one country. It's because the international horizon of the revolution is dead, now we have socialism in one country. It declares the victory of socialism in all branches of the national economy had abolished the exploitation of man by man. Then if history has been fulfilled in the triumph of the communist party state, the only sphere remaining for battle, and it is a sphere where battle would never cease, was consciousness. And I quote here from the short course, the major danger of the remnants of nationalism and bourgeois ideology is the deviation against which we have ceased to fight, thereby allowing it to grow into a danger to the state." End of the quote. While the state had lived up to the material and infrastructural demands of socialism, the enemies of socialism to be found in society, and most often in the party and state cadres, had not fully cut up. Against this looming threat, Stalin encouraged the party to keep up its guard, and keep our, our powder dry, this is a quote from the short course, for upcoming and inevitable confrontation. So, long story short, the Stalinist version of Diamat as a philosophy science at once, a science materialized as a particular social formation, has reached its triumphant fulfillment in the party of the proletariat, here to be read as the Soviet state as a permanent ahistorical formation. Of course, this is miles away from Lenin's withering way of the state. In the conditions of the Stalinist acceleration of class struggle. And the paradox is here. While rhetorically insisting on the interpenetration of opposites and thus also on contradictions and on the law of unceasing movement, um, the Amat as orthodoxy freezes historical movement and territorializes it on the Soviet state. 
read dialectically, we could say that in this conception, once history is fulfilled, it, it accomplishes a full circle and meets nature, or it becomes nature. Here, history appears as natural history brought about by the permanent form of the bureaucratic one-party state machine. Once Diamat triumphs as power, dialectic is suspended. Yet, as I mentioned, in the socialist Diamat, in the Stalinist Diamat, one sphere that was yet to be conquered, and that sphere was consciousness, and hence we could say Stalin's second turn in 1932, that started a wholesale attack on the avant-garde and the prolet cult of the 20s that initially, during his first turn in 1928, he used to get rid of the traditionalists of the nap years. <laughs> so now he's uh, going back to the traditionalists to get rid of the avant-garde and the prolet cult. It seemed that the final nail on the coffin of the Bolshevik 20s where the avant-garde experiment and complex dialogue with tradition cohibited was being prepared as Anatoly Zhdanov, uh, sorry, Andrei Zhdanov. Um, oops. Wow, we were seeing Zhdanov all along, I didn't know. Andrei Zhdanov introduced the term socialist realism in a 1932 article in the Literaturnaya Gazeta. Subsequently, it was declared as the official doctrine in the 1934 Soviet Congress, uh, All Soviet Congress of Writers, affirming entry to the final period of socialist construction in conjunction with the anti fascist Popular Front, Comrade Zhdanov called for the eradication of the last bourgeois elements from social life and from consciousness. And this was precisely the task of socialist realism. And I quote Zhdanov, overcoming the survivals of capitalism in the consciousness of people means fighting against all relics of bourgeois influence of the, the proletariat, against laxity, against loafing, against idling, against petty bourgeois, dissoluteness and individualism, against an attitude of graft and dishonesty towards public property." End of the quote. Zhdanov affirmed Stalin's call for writers to be, and here's the scary concept, engineers of human souls, firmly grounded in the material basis of social life and urged them to replace bourgeois romanticism with what he called revolutionary romanticism. According to Zhdanov, the task of Soviet literature and of socialist realism was to overcome the belatedness of consciousness in comparison to the advanced level of the relations of production. Um, yeah. And it was this type of new consciousness that had to be engineered. Art, literature, music, film had a crucial and instrumental function. This engineering of consciousness had to start with the new Soviet man, with Stalin here acting as the arbiter of the supreme care for the human being. And actually, Yuri Kharkin uh, says Stalin is the most abstract humanist and the most concrete killer. He's a strange dialectic between the abstract and the concrete. But the project of engineering the soul or conquering consciousness always remains an incomplete one. And it is this incompleteness that opens up art and aesthetics towards the dialectical historical temporality uh, of the movement of contradictions um, that was, I argue, was dormant uh, in the Leninist revolutionary project. Particular artworks, while standing for a universal truth, never completely exhaust the actualization of this truth. So there's a kind of futurity uh, within this ideal. And this is precisely why in Soviet Marx and aesthetic theory, art and aesthetics are not entirely subjected to the natural ontological totalization by the official Diamat. Even in its most vulgar dialectical materialist schematization, art was conceived in terms of the ideal. This ideal should be understood in terms of Lenin's theory of reflection, and I quote, as a subjective image of the objective reality that is the reflection of the external world in the forms of human activity, in the forms of his consciousness and will. End of the quote. Lenin's reflection of nature in man's thought and its representation in Russian uh, atrajenia and atabrajenia can't be detached from the theory of truth because representation is not a mechanistic imprint of the empirical world, but the rendering of reality in its multifaceted, contradictory, and dynamic movement. 
and the way in which it reflects on human consciousness through its transformative power. In a sense, the ideal is the ideal totality of objective truth that needs to be concretized through practice, praxis, yet never completely attained. The ideal in the dialectically most nuanced articulations of socialist realist aesthetic theory is transhistorical, but this transhistoricity is one which is historically constituted through man's conscious productive activity, through labor. The ideal, thus, we could say, is the ideal, is the, is the historical, transhistorical measure of objective norms in each sphere of human activity that orients consciousness towards truth, goodness, beauty, justice, maybe freedom, <laughs> but not cultural. The ideal is the ideal of communism, in short. I argue that because of the historical and transhistorical nature of the ideal, that the dialectically induced Soviet Marxian aesthetic theory articulated, socialist realist aesthetic theory could be, in some sense, considered the Achilles' heel of the official Stalinist Diamat. The Stalinist Diamat could not fully subsume the aesthetics in its system and method alike. And the contradictions of socialist realist aesthetic um, theory is the following. On the one hand, it is instrumental in engineering the human soul, and on the other hand, it remains more or less the only sphere where a non-schematic conception of the relationship between the so-called infrastructure and the sphere of ideology still persisted. So this engineering can never be a complete project. And this was so even during the most nightmarish years of the Stalinist combat on the philosophical front, where a form of Hegelianism or materialistically ingested objective idealism could be a crime against the party and the state. And what aesthetic theory preserves is the historical dialectical temporality of the Leninist project in conditions when Lenin, and I quote uh, art historian Vartan Nazatian, when, when Stalin had expelled historical time from social life through the regime of deadlines, through first five-year plans, through acceleration uh, of class struggle, and so on. Then what are the characteristics of socialist realism? First and foremost, it is crucial to stress that in socialist realist aesthetic theory, is, theory is not external to art. Neither theory is a meta-theory applicable to art, but a theory internal to art itself. Socialist realism emerged in the conditions of the Stalinist appropriation of references to the historical past from which select contents could be recycled for forming the new culture of now, now triumphant socialism. Formerly, socialist realism was an eclectic combination of neoclassicism and photographic naturalism, a return to the forms of the 19th century critical realism as literary and artistic technique. And in the case of some of the Soviet republics, it implied <coughs> ethno-folkloric themes with socialist content. At times, this resulted in very strange combinations of modernist aesthetics and socialist realist content. It also often entailed appropriating select elements from the culture of the so-called progressive bourgeoisie, of the local national traditions, and subjecting them to the demands of social reality. Socialist realism relied on three main pillars. Number one, the classical heritage that was granted a trans-historical status, the heritage of Greco-Roman antiquity, the role of art and literature as not only reflective, but also of transformative of reality, and then also the conception of the new Soviet men. Socialist realism was stylistically incoherent since it functioned as a general cultural principle in art production, theory, and criticism rather than as a style or a form. The demands were oriented towards the content of works, typicheness or typicality, which was not the summation of all uh, uh, individual units, but a kind of an essential expression of a social type. Partinist, or the party orientation, party direction. Narodnist, directed towards the people. 
um, and classivist or its class orientation and the supreme quality idzeinist adhering to the idea. Socialist realism relied on the conception of a changing but internally united artistic process where the newness was derived from the new social content, from this new social reality rather than formal novelty such as in bourgeois art. With its principle of affirming light in an optimistic rendering, socialist realism provided an ideological representation of life as an image from the future, one that appeared as actualized in the present. If the Russian avant-garde in the 20s attempted to shape the subconscious through laying bare the device, through astranenia, estrangement, the socialist realism sublimated the device. The reality is not a construction, but an ideal image of the future produced as real. So it was this ideal of the future possible only as an image rendered in representation in the present that supported the Soviet version of art's autonomy, even if the ideological mandate of such art was to be instrumental for the proletarian state. This ideal in socialist realism had the function of surpassing the very ideological conditions in which it emerged. It was this ideal that despite the prevailing instrumentalization of art under state socialism, supported the autonomy or we could even say semi-autonomy of aesthetics. The paradox of socialist realism in terms of its relation to and location in historical time as I conceive it is then the following. One of its central imperatives was the depiction of reality in its revolutionary unfolding or what we can call my messes in process as process and that it is future oriented. And on the other hand, it arrests this temporality of historical unfolding as if it has been realized in the present. So we could also claim that structurally it functions similarly to the official Diamat. While grounding the philosophy of Marxist-Leninism in nature and in nature's core attribute of the movement of matter, Stalinism utilized Diamat in order to conceive of the Stalinist state as the ultimate teleological culmination of natural historical processes. And this is what I call the suspension of the, Stalinist suspension of the dialectic, one that was done in the name of the dialectic itself. And this reverberated to Stalinist accelerationism, accelerationism of class struggle, acceleration of achieving socialism in one country, with a Stalinist regime of productivist deadlines, Stakhanov, Stakhanovism, uh, the cult of the productive working man. In short, accelerationism without any intermediate steps, which was Stalin's race against time in order to defeat the gap between the temporality of human life and the slower transformation of social institutions. Socialist realism had a core humanistic orientation that relied on man's victory over the forces of nature and unreason. Actually, this is a very funny uh, image, funny in the sense that during the Cold War, this uh, image was utilized with very different titles according to the uh, political, lens, political um, scene evolving. So here it's against Truman's tank and uh, during the rapprochement between the USSR and Soviet Union in the 60s, it was, it was attributed to the Cold War. Um, Victor, uh, with the World War II victory of the Soviet Union against uh, fascism. Um, so socialist realism believed that by utilizing all previous progressive achievements of human culture, it could bring about a new artistic consciousness. The dialectic of socialist realism was ultimately a positive one that could be summarized as optimistic humanism, one which often bordered bureaucratic optimism. And yet this optimistic humanism as ideal was hard achieved and the conception of art as a substitute image of a reality more real than reality itself was difficult to sustain in the face of existing contradictions or the contradictions becoming visible in the post-Stalinist period. Yet, as with a wide range of representational forms available to render social reality in its truthfulness with the doctrine of socialist realism, it's theorizations that centered on the relationship of art and literature to social being or to objective reality also allowed for debate and discussion. And the, the second part of my talk will focus on this debate. 
And as with the main conceptions of philosophy and dialectical materialism, theorizations of the relationship between art and reality ranged from sociological and positivist accounts to dialectical ones. And it is the latter that I contest preserves the historical temporality of the yet incomplete and perhaps failed revolutionary project. It is because it conceived of the ideal, of the communist ideal, as not a project in space realized by socialism in one country and the Stalinist regime of deadlines, but as a project in time, one that was yet to come. If we are to break from the commonplace conception that socialist realism was a monolithic doctrine, it is enough to refer to two philosophers from the so-called stream of the 30s. Georg Lukács is known to the Western readers because of his early affiliation with the Frankfurt School and his rehabilitation by Western Marxism of the 80s, especially by Fred Jameson. The second figure, Michael Lifshitz, is virtually unknown with one, only one of his works available in English uh, in a poor translation, his 1931, The Philosophy of Art of Karl Marx. Yet Lifshitz developed what one could claim to be the most coherent theory of art based on Marxian principles. Throughout the Soviet 30s, both Lukács and Lifshitz were working at the Marx-Engels Institute in Moscow, raged a long and arduous battle against the schematic, mechanistic, and vulgar conceptions of art and literature that triumphed in the wake of the prolet cult and continued a transformed afterlife in the name of the proletarian state in the 30s. Vulgar sociologism conceives of art and culture, this is what they were fighting against, as a direct product of social relations. For both Lifshitz and Lukács, reducing art and literature to a reflection of the conditions of a single class, in Lunacharsky's words, the idea that the decadent class can only produce decadent art and an apple tree can only breed apples, or to what Lifshitz called the consciousness of the fabrica factory being, fabrichno uh, zavodny byt, amounts to forsaking the question of truth and the aesthetic ideal. In his critical historical evaluation of Plekhanov's sociological conception of art, Mikhail Lifshitz states, the only true rule over art that art needs to acknowledge is the rule of truth. End of quote. Referring to Lenin's theory of reflection and combining it with the Marxian understanding of art and culture as practical spiritual appropriation of the world, both Lukács and Lifshitz conceived of art and literature as reflections of objective, multifaceted historical reality. If the era of Lukács' pen was directed largely against the German prolet cult writers of the 20s and early 30s, and a certain Comrade Bredel uh, was a prominent point of antagonism, Lukács should say, Comrade Brendel, you are too uh, mechanistic. Lifshitz addressed the mechanistic conceptions of socialist realism directly. And here, and this is very important to note, we are not talking about dissidents. We are talking about, about we are dealing with orthodox Marxists and defenders of socialist realism within, yet against, Stalinism. In a 1936 article, Lenin and Artistic Criticism, Lifshitz argued for the revival of the forgotten Leninist foundations of critique contra the vulgar sociologist appropriation of the theory of reflection as a one-sided and one-dimensional class symbolism. The sociologist reduces class analysis in art and literature to its determination by social psychological types that are true from the position of only one class and false from the position of an antagonistic class. As opposed to this, in Lenin's theory of reflection, Lifshitz argued, class analysis is not reduced to subjective psychological factors, but is rooted in a deep understanding of tr the truth, embedded in class relations, where the subjective side of class ideology is derived from the objective truth. The proletarian ideology is not a mere result of the fabric of factory being, reflective of the psychology of the working class only but rather the true class consciousness is achieved through the ways in which the cultural, moral, and political lives of all classes in society relate to one another. 
and it is through a complex understanding of social totality that the proletarian gains consciousness as such, rather than merely acquiring proletarian consciousness. In short, class consciousness is irre irreducible to the consciousness of one class. If the Stalinist diamat and the schematic view of culture as a derivative product of socio-economic conditions declare synchronicity between forces of production, relations of production and social consciousness, both Lifshitz and Lukács refer to the non-synchronous development of art and literature in relation to the development of productive forces. In Hegel's dialectical movement of the spirit through its historical actualization that they quoted, historical development is not a harmonious ascent through synthesis, but what Lifshitz, paraphrasing Hegel, calls a brutal and involuntary war against itself. In Marx, this negativity at the very heart of the spirit is materialistically translated to the non-synchronicity between the forces of production and relations of production and social consciousness. And of course, we can recall here that for Marx, historical development is uneven and older modes of production continue their withering afterlife in capitalism and also in early socialism. This non-synchronicity that Stalin tried to undo was that which foregrounded a Marxian conception of, conception of historical temporality within capitalism that is both heterogeneous and uneven. The Stalinist sch schematization of the dialectic accomplishes a double violence. It achieves a quick synthesis of contradictions, a sort of fast food resolution of contradictions, and by doing so, it sees the Stalinist state as the triumphant culmination of the teleology of nature turned to a teleology of history. And the 1956 article, right, in the aftermath of the 20th Congress that denounced Stalin, Lukács reflects upon the bastardization of the dialectic in Stalinism as one that reads social life of contradictions and as one that lives on even after the leader's death. On the one hand, the Stalinist schema reduces all historical life to vulgar matter, and on the other hand, it results in extreme forms of vulgar idealism and subjective psychologism. In an essay titled Critical Realism and Socialist Realism, Lukács says, and I quote, if Marxist-Leninist objectivism is abandoned, though a nominal, subjectively sincere adherence to it may persist, the dialectical unity of theory and practice of freedom and necessity will be lost or dangerously weakened. The complex relationship between fundamental theory and everyday life, the day-to-day -day needs of political action will be short-circuited." End of the quote. And instead of a guide to practice, theory becomes a doxa, while the elements of the contradiction between the two are eliminated. More of Lukács. If the elimination of this antagonistic character of contradiction is seen as something immediately realizable, rather than as a process, both the antagonism and contradiction, the motor of all development will disappear from the reality to be depicted. If in the Marxian dialectical conception, the non-antagonistic contradiction prevails gradually, though contradiction never disappears, the Stalinist tiger's leap into the future precisely provides an accelerated resolution of both antagonism and contradiction into a total synthesis. Um, I'll skip here um, just to get to uh, end my talk with Lifshitz. Um, so in short, uh, what Lukács was arguing uh, in this article is that the schematic optimism of the happy ending that characterized socialist realism of both, uh, both in art and literature degraded historical opti optimism into a mere schematic optimism while constructing a, what he called a pseudo-artistic superstructure resting on a pre-existing history. And perhaps this is precisely why both Lifshitz and Lukács, we find socialist realism as an unrealized ideal, whereas both presented vehement theoretical defenses for SR, socialist realism, Lukács nevertheless found consolation in 19th century critical realism that for him remained formally unsurpassed, while Lifshitz didn't find anything in his contemporary culture that would exceed the classical ideal supplied by Greek antiquity. So the form of socialist realism for them was never, never sufficient. It never arrived 
to where it should be. In a way, socialist realism for them was not only a doctrine of the present, but an ideal, a standard to come. For both Lukács and Lifshitz, it's the ideal as one that is transhistorical yet historically constituted that provides a ground for a non-deterministic, non-schematic relation between art and social be being. And the, the last section of my paper uh, on Lifshitz, throughout his writing, he consistently referred to the aesthetic ideal as that which on the one hand preserves aesthetics from what he called the plebeian and nihilistic rejection of high culture, and on the other hand, from the bourgeois iconoclastic anti-art tendency. But the fuller articulation of this concept of the ideal came in the last years of his life, in the early 80s, when he was developing a posthumous dialogue with a by then deceased Soviet philosopher, Ewald Ilyenkov. Ilyenkov throughout his lifetime until his suicide in 1979 worked on the question of consciousness and the concept of the ideal from uh, the perspective of the theory of knowledge and the theory of cognition. It is beyond the scope of this paper to argue, with, uh, to, to engage with Ilyenkov's complex and materialistically grounded concept of the ideal, where he views the latter as a, uh, the objective universal and collective historical product of human productive activity. But Lifshitz uh, formulates his notion of the ideal while engaging with Ilyenkov's uh, materialist, uh, object, uh, materialist slash objective idealist position. Through this, Lifshitz grounds the ideal ontologically, not only in human historical productive activity, but also in nature and in the biological human. This is when Engels returns. <laughs> so we have a very weird mix of return to Engels via Hegel as well. Lifshitz's dialectical materialist position is that nature and its forms leave their imprint on man, and if there is no ideality in nature, how does ideality arise in human societies? In one word, Lifshitz says, ideality exists in material being and in consciousness, both in society and in nature, or else it exists nowhere. He formulates the ideal as a sort of equilibrium between the material and the spiritual worlds, and I quote, the great role of human consciousness is in that it has broken away from the confines of its own or organicity and in the ideal it has reached with the infinite material world outside of us. End of quote. In a Hegelian vein, ideality for Lifshitz is a movement through which the real strives towards identity with its concept and becomes a condition for truth. Ideal is the ghost of the true being of the material since it haunts the real with ideality. For instance, society is identical with its concept with the arrival of the communist society and until then, the truth that communism embodies as ideal haunts the society that has yet to be identical with its concept. In Lifshitz's positive dialectic, there is a movement towards higher forms of truth, good and beauty embedded in the purposefulness of nature that extends to human world, to the social world. He says that there is an ideal in the world, but it does not pass through the front gate. In the world of commodities, on the one hand, the reification of consciousness via commodities, but also the reification, uh, the Stalinist reification um, that merged together in the 80s, the relationship between man and nature is perverse and antagonistic. Yet ideality for Lifshitz is that which strives towards harmonizing this relationship. So for him, man's labor is that mediating life activity, which reveals the objective qualities embedded in nature and develops their ideality with his labor, with his art. And this is the last quote from Lifshitz. The form of the pot, it's not the last, sorry. The form of the pot is not alien to the material that it is made of. The form of the statue is somewhat contained in the piece of marble, in a ideal, or in the potential. And the sculpture only reveals the excess, it throws away the excess through a long known yet deep metaphor. It is good or ideal that the sculptor reveals in a piece of marble the natural forms capable of conveying forms of other objects. It is bad or unideal when a piece of gold out of which toilets will be made at some point in time turn into fetishes. End of the quote. 
In a move that sounds rather Adornian, if we disregard uh, Lifshitz's philosophical foundations in dialectical materialism, he says that spiritual labor is a sphere of freedom at its best, and when it is subjected to material productive labor because of historical conditions, that is when it becomes necessary in a direct economic sense, then in principle it does not correspond to its concept to its true nature. So we have a kind of a positivist dialectic between freedom and necessity. So similar to how form arises from marble itself, the ideal has to liberate itself from the material to become an ideal and thus to gain autonomy. This is the socialist realist conception of arts autonomy through the ideal. For Lifshitz, what provides the foundation for this process lies in the very objective reality. Just need two more minutes. <laughs> He says, the drama of contemporary civilization clearly demonstrates that alienated representations and stereotypes can crush all ideality. The ideals of reason, of good, and of beauty. If reality itself, indifferent in its natural or social material being, does not meet halfway the social thought that is locked in them. And it is a good thing that the force of this reality destroys what is ready-made in culture when what Engels calls triumph of realism is accomplished. End of the quote. Lifshitz was writing these lines as the Soviet state ideology was disintegrating, and yet, upholding his belief in communist ideals, he was convinced that the triumph of realism resided in the capacity of objective social reality to preserve an advanced ideal such that reality would puncture reified representations and stereotypes. T terrifying uh, notion for us today. Objective reality coming to our consciousness. Coming from the Soviet Union, Lifshitz's insistence on the primacy of objective reality as generative for realism may sound today like an echo from another world, and it is. Yet the question of realism, far from being passé, keeps returning. Even if the horizon of communism is moving further and further away, whether conceived as my masses or construction, the question of realism tends to become central in times of mature social and political contradictions that require a means of figuration and representation. And one lesson that we can perhaps take from socialist realist aesthetic theory, as outmoded as it may seem today, in today's world of post-post-post-Trump truths, is how to capture and represent the complex reality a world in motion that in its late capitalist stage splits and fractures into so many fragments that veil the ability to understand the generative forces of such fragmentation. We can't and should not desire to revive socialist realism. And yet, perhaps what we can unearth today in socialist realist aesthetic theory is the dormant temporality of the Marxian revolutionary project actualized by Lenin as a counter thrust to the erasure of historical contradictions in our post-Stalinist, late capitalist, neoliberal present. What we can unearth, in short, is perhaps the communist ideal. Thank you. <laughs>